Kevin, you want to take it away and just start at the top and let's, let's do the overview. Like what are the different type of oil wells that people can build? Okay. Uh, why don't I share my screen? Some of these I would say have more or less earning potential for you uh, based on, you know, just the uh, monetization strategy of them, but, and along the same lines, some of them are more or less um, um, passive when you, when you set them up. So um, I don't know where you would like to start, but we can sort of talk about maybe the potential earning potential versus passivity or whatever the right word is. <laughs> and, well, that makes sense, right? It's, it's kind of like there's always a trade-off and yeah. some of these get more complex. And as the complexity increases, there's more work to do. There's more things, there's more moving pieces. Generally speaking, uh, when we take that complexity on, we want to do so because the thought of increased rewards. So there might be some, some for the, some, for the advanced viewers, uh, it might be interesting to go that down that path, but if this is your first oil well, and if you're just trying to get your first ones going, we want to stick towards the simpler side of things that, um, are really going to help you just get into motion and get through the whole process, the whole cycle to where you get in the oil pumping on your first one. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm easy. I'm, I'm easy to start. You want to just start at the top and work our way around clockwise. Sure, man. Perfect. So oh. go ahead. Oh, yeah. The first one, I mean, books and ebooks, right? So um, yeah. ebooks have been sold online for ever since, since the online game has been a thing. And then the books, we can go as far to like create space in Amazon and Kindle, right? For the, the traditional style books. But then there's, there's ebooks that sell for $47, $97 and beyond. Generally speaking, ebooks are going to be relatively easy to create. Um, I mean, there's even software tools that'll assist you in, in the book creation and publishing, but on the book side of things, the value isn't always there. For example, when was the last uh, Kindle book that you purchased that was more than 20 bucks? When was the last print book, physical real print book that you purchased that was more than 20 bucks? Uh, some people might know of uh, Breakthrough Advertising, which is kind of a classic that's worth a few hundred bucks, but there's very few books that are worth hundreds of dollars and with that said, just looking behind Kevin right here, he's got a bookshelf full of books. People buy books as gifts. People buy books quickly, uh, regularly, and effectively. So it's almost an easy product for people to purchase, but it might not be the highest value. Um, and generally, books can lead into additional kinds of, of products. And, and the traffic from a book could, could lead deeper into a funnel, which we'll talk about more in the future. Yeah, I would say to... Um... The nice thing about books, ebooks, and I just added audiobooks because that's a new thing. Yep. Um, the nice thing about them is they are very passive. Um, you can put them on platforms that have ready-made traffic for you. And, you know, I, I, Miles knows the story, we'll tell it in the group, but, um, you know, I, I have ebooks that I paid someone else to write over a decade ago that are still making me money today and not a ton, but enough to pay for a car payment, you know, and that like a good car payment. And that's pretty awesome. You know, I, I haven't, I never did any real work on it other than coming up with the idea for the book. And I spent some money to build it. And now they're still 10 years later paying me hundreds of dollars a month. So there's a real sort of, power to a method like that. Um, the, the, uh, downside of course, is that the, like Miles just said, there's downward pricing pressure for that type of market. So right. the prices are going to get less and less over time. And so just a quick story on my side, my wife and I have about six different books available and we're leveraging the Amazon platform because there's millions of people on Amazon who have credit cards in hands and they bought Kindle devices, right? And what do you do with a Kindle device? You want to add books to it. So we have uh, quite a few books that are priced between 99 cents and five ninety nine. Uh, on Kindle, you get 70% uh, royalties above $2.99. So you get about $2.10 per sale at three bucks. Uh, we've got five books on there. We've sold tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of copy. It's completely hands-off. Our first book went up in 20, 2012. So that was nine years ago as of this recording. And it generates, you know, between 
between 75 and a few hundred dollars, depending on the book, every single month. Uh, right now, we're working on running paid ads to them. Uh, this is kind of a newer thing to, mm -hmm. to increase because if they like our competitors or if they're looking at buying our competitors' book, we should make sure that our books show up right next to it. Um, so we took kind of the, because correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, you are selling that yourself. Uh, it's hosted on your own website and you're driving traffic to your own website to sell those books on your end, correct? Well, so the books I was just talking about that make, you know, a few hundred bucks a month, those are on Amazon. Oh, perfect. Um, so yep. that's a different story. But I will say I have a business that is one of my bigger digital oil wells that sells what started out as ebooks that now I would consider them courses. Courses. Uh, so it, it, uh, it's in the test prep niche. And um, when I started it 15 years ago, we were providing them at first with a physical book, that manual, like the old big box of stuff, right? That we were sending them with binders and, and printed books. But the cost of actually fulfilling that was so high that people preferred the digital version for a cheaper price. And, and yeah. And so we sold probably 500,000 units of, of eBooks, um, you know, that we had built that people could print themselves and save the money of us having to ship them and print them and put them in binders and do all this stuff. And then around 2013 or 14, we transitioned those, maybe it was 15, somewhere around there. We transitioned those into actual video courses that, um, you know, it just made it easier for people to consume. And that sort of uh, became the norm back in 2006 when I started that business. It wasn't the norm and there weren't all the tools that are available today when it comes yeah. to, to Learning management delivering systems. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And the price, did the price go up as you e elaborated into video format? Like, did you increase the price from where it was? No, nope. okay. I kept so the system. price the same. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome value. And then one other note on this before we jump to the next one. Um, so my wife's audio books or her books, not audio books, uh, which is something we have on the roadmap. Um, they're actually byproducts of the MP3 products we've sold. So what we did is we actually took the transcriptions. And so it's actually a byproduct of something we also sold elsewhere. Um, I have another book in the works um, from the Miles Becker brand that's me teaching YouTube. And I actually did the whole framework, the whole outline. I brain dumped it in a video that's live for free on my YouTube channel. Now I'm working on copy editing it to take that same content, turn it into a short Kindle ebook shooting for about 20,000 words on that to get it up live there. So the, the kind of idea I want, I want folks to hold on to is if you're already kind of pseudo expert, if you've got a lot of content, if you've been teaching people how to do something specific that they value, you might be able to take what you're already doing and rework it into multiple formats. Um, and with that said, what do you say we jump to the next one, keep it moving? Yeah. So if we're going clockwise, I guess that's newsletters. That and sure looks like it. Yeah. The reason that I put newsletters on here as its own thing is that there are some guys who have built amazing businesses based off of newsletters. Um, like Dan Kennedy is yeah. one, um, you know, it's, it was the tip of the spear for his whole business. Uh, you know, the newsletter sales um, and, and physical print books. Right. Um, and then the second is uh, companies like Agora and boardroom you know, they would sell yearly subscriptions to newsletters and then they would use that as a platform to sell more stuff. Um, yeah. But I think that newsletters themselves are great uh, oil wells in that you can sell the past um, like, you know, so so the idea behind it, I know we talked about this a little bit in the last video, the ethos of doing the work um, once that can be valuable again and again and again. And um, it does take, say, if you're doing a monthly newsletter, it takes work every month to do it. But the reason that I consider it an oil well is that it's the same amount of work if you are selling that newsletter to 10 people or 10,000. And that's powerful. 
And the, the, the secondary piece of that is you're building up a back catalog of, of like real valuable content that people will buy. I had a guy literally today purchase our newsletter and ask if he could buy all the past issues. And that's a common thing that people do. And so, and there's so many valuable uh, reasons to have a good newsletter. So hundred percent. And I think a newsletter can bridge into a membership program if one's interested, right? If you want to go to the oil field, but the whole selling all the back issues um, and it works wonderfully in so many niches. So Ben Settle in the email space, he sells his back issues for, I believe, $97 each. So you get in on a free one, you start loving the new ones they are 97. And then if you want the older ones that were topical, um, I find right now in so 2021, um, my inbox is a mess. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. And I think a lot of people are feeling me on that. And I am letting less and less free I'm, I'm letting less and less free newsletters into my inbox and I'm focusing my inbox on ones I'm paying for. And I pay yeah. for subscriptions from many different people in many different disciplines, mostly in the marketing space and the investing space, because that's what I'm about. Uh, the varying prices are from $10 a month on the lowest uh, to some that I pay a few thousand dollars per year on the investing side depending on what I expect to get out of it. Um, and what's cool is today, so we have Substack is really gaining a lot of steam and Substack is a kind of a done for you, done with you newsletter platform that when someone's already a Substack user for them to buy your Substack is just a click of a button, right? So it's kind of a marketplace for newsletters, which are great. Um, but ultimately, I think the newsletters are a way for an expert or someone who is aggressively researching a topic to summarize everything they know or everything that they're learning and to put it on a silver platter for someone like me who I want to learn more about crypto. I want to learn more about DeFi. I want to learn more about some of these things. I don't have the eight hours, 10, 12, 14 hours per week to really go down the rabbit hole on all of these things. So I found a few trusted people and it's the same in options and, and um, uranium investing, like all of these things that I'm kind of in interested in, but I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole and do all the research. So I pay people to do that research for me and I receive it in the form of uh, everything. So a daily, weekly, and monthly. I don't think any are quarterly, but daily, weekly, and monthly newsletters I pay for. I probably pay personally, um, I would say $500 a month or more. And these are the people that are highlighted in my inbox. I care most about their opinions. I believe personal kind of just throwing my um, prediction hat on more and more people are going to want more paid newsletters in the future because it's a signal to noise challenge that we're all dealing with in our inboxes. And I really do believe that when we're like, I'm buying this from this person, that's a commitment to really reading their information, to really getting it versus that lead magnet sounds kind of interesting. I'm going to go for that. Not to say there's not room for both, but just kind of a, a personal philosophy there. Well, and how did we meet? Hundred, I purchased your subscription. Absolutely. Right. Uh, I found your YouTube video and I was like, this dude's really smart. And I went down, I literally reverse engineered. I was like, what is this guy selling? And I, I found your uh, infinite ROI newsletter and I read every single one of them. And it actually did morph into a, um, the, the first, um, community that you built. Uh, and, um, and, and here we are today. Yep. How funny is that? Right. It, it's cool. It, it's fun to see. Um, it, in action as we're, as we're discussing it. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, the, the two things about newsletters, there's email newsletters and there are physical newsletters. I personally prefer, uh, it, well, it depends on what you're selling the person afterwards, or if you want yeah. to sell anything afterwards, you know, the truth is, is at the peak, Dan Kennedy had roughly 20,000 people subscribing to his newsletter, and he was charging those people fifty nine dollars per month, it, it, anywhere from uh, twenty nine to fifty nine. He had different price points that he tested through time, but do the math on that. I mean, that's yeah. pretty good business in and of itself. Just writing a newsletter every month, or doing so, the one thing, and yeah. it leads to his big events. And like Terry Dean has a very inexpensive marketing newsletter that transitions people to his thousand dollar a month coaching program, and it's it's just that front end. So again, it can become an oil field, but I do have people who that's all they do. And, and they're supported by their community through that one thing. So it's like, it, it has the benefit of being expandable, but it's not required to do that. And yeah. the newsletter itself can easily be multiple five figures and beyond type cash flow. 
Well, I think Ben, ben Settle's only business is his newsletter too. And right? it has been for 15 years. Yeah. And he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't, uh, he's very um, uh, picky in some ways and he runs people off and I'm sort of the same. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I don't think he gets polite way of saying it, but I it. think he does at some point a few years ago, I heard him say that he makes 30 grand a month from his newsletter. Yeah. So that's not bad. You know, um, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye, as they that's say. For sure. Um, so moving on, uh, subscriptions. Um, so just so that I, I made this um, little mind map. And so I want to clarify what I mean by these things, I guess, so that um, Miles and I can talk about them. under subscriptions. I am throwing in uh, memberships. So like low ticket type memberships where you're not um, coaching people per se, but you're, you're, you know, putting uh, a great community together. And then also uh, physical subscriptions to things like um, uh, box services, um, you know, of the month clubs, you know, the jelly of the month club, the gift that keeps on giving Clark, you know, um, and so, so there's the, it's a, it's kind of a big category. There's a lot of difference, you know, I could make this octopus have lots of little hairy tentacles on the end. Uh, if I want to go down that rabbit hole and we will in the course over time, but the, the big idea here is something that you are charging a monthly, uh, amount for, and people are in it. So and my wife and I, one of our memberships is essentially ongoing meditations. Uh, to say it very, very technically, what it is, is is MP3 files on a very regular basis, right? You get a certain number of MP3 files. So there's deliverables. Uh, it, there's a, a bit of a treadmill on there, but uh, compared to the 40-hour job, it, it's a wonderful treadmill that we're on there. Um, and then the box of the month clubs are super popular. Uh, I had one student of mine, uh, she runs a quilting shop. Uh, she's in the quilting niche, and she had been doing a box of the month club where you get a certain amount of fabrics and she kind of pre-makes, pre-populates it. She gets it all in the box. So she had a physical business, like she had a physical quilt shop. She had all this stuff hanging around, all this material hanging around. She's like, well, what if I just did it for them? And for her customers, it became just easy button. And they just got kind of like a pattern and all the stuff to make the pattern. It just showed up. They love quilting. They just didn't want to do the research. Bingo. It filled a specific need. And I think that's the one thing that, that memberships are always going to do is they're, they're going to fill a specific need for people. Um, and sometimes there's the, the trunk club for men, right? I need to look classy. I need to look like I know what's going on in fashion. Uh, luckily, I don't have that challenge in my life. I, I got it going on, but like, so there's, there's, there's these different things. There's even as far as um, like watch clubs where, where you cycle a new fancy watch in. So you've always got a new fancy bling watch on it. Um, it's a, the signal flashing type stuff. And then, you know, you go down the marketing world, like, of course, there's a million and one marketing memberships and stuff in, in our world. And even in the um, investing memberships, the ability to connect with other investors who are doing the same sort of thing that you're doing to get uh, stock tips on a regular basis type things. Mm -hmm. um, it, can, it can go out in, into many different areas. Yeah, so I have a membership right now that actually um, spawned from my newsletter because I, I the one 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 difference between newsletters and memberships to make as a distinction if you're doing it like an online membership is if you have a very fast moving marketplace that you're serving print newsletters and even email newsletters it's difficult sometimes to have the speed that you need to keep up with the marketplace and uh, sometimes also um, email and print can be um, uh, they can limit your ability to like things that you could explain in a five minute video might take 10,000 words in a print newsletter. So it's, it's sometimes more convenient to, to serve a niche in, um, in a membership way than the newsletter way, even though in some respects, the uh, mechanism is the same, right? Um, so like I, I, I had the infinite ROI newsletter, 
which was talking about marketing and things like that. I transitioned that into the labs, which is an online community for marketers, which it, the idea behind the labs is I can just, you know, it's, there, there's a lot of elements to it, but one of them is what's happening now. Like what's, yeah. you know, the, 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 the landscape changes. And I will say for an online membership, if you have one of the keys to having one that has high retention, like churn is always a problem in subscriptions and, and to have one that has high retention, I would say um, one of the, the real um, uh, things that makes it work is if you have a, a changing marketplace, like the best uh, subscription memberships are things like stock market crypto, horse racing, um, uh, daily fantasy sports. Like there's a, there's a, a parade that is always moving of, of new information that you can, that, that people like you, Miles, will pay someone to synthesize, summarize, and explain to you in a shorter format so that you don't have to go out and spend the eight hours doing that. And so having a membership that, that offers that service, you know, there's, there's a million of them out there right now. One of my first memberships that I ever did, it, it wasn't my first one, but it was my first successful one, was a horse racing um, membership for people that like to bet on the horses. This was back in the early 2000s. And people logged in every single day because they wanted to see what was going on at the tracks that day. They wanted the, the insider's edge, you know, and and uh, and so that that I would say, like having a membership and, and keeping churn down is difficult if you're doing like something that isn't a moving sidewalk. If it's like a fixed duration container of information. I'm going to take you from not knowing how to build a blog to having a blog with traffic. That that game hasn't changed since since 20, 2005, right? So it's, it's a number of steps. And then when you get somebody to hear, they're like, why am I still paying you at this point? Versus option prices are changing every day. Or we now live in the world of like DraftKings, right? So uh, betting is now legal again in the US at sports betting. So there's this whole world of DraftKings out there where you can bet on everything. Right now, PGA is super hot. Man, like a lot of people don't have the time to go down and make the picks, even if you go to fantasy football, right? Like, so you got like fantasy football is huge. People want to win. They want bragging rights over their friends. They're not going to spend 70, 80 hours to do all the research on who are the best picks. But boy, if I can get into a subscription that says, who should I draft? Who should I play each week? And, and I literally have a helpful guide that's going to do all the work for me. It cost me $19.99 a month. And I might get bragging rights over my friends. 20 bucks a month, bragging rights over my friends, maybe even winning the pot because some of those have, it's those kinds of value propositions that we're actually offering. And I love the idea of the constantly moving marketplace on the physical side of things um, for the box of the month club. I think it really comes down to consumables make really good sense in this world as well. Um, yeah. If you want like really clean soaps, fresh smelling, like different types of candles, different, uh, there's one called goddess provisions that are all these spiritual items, everything from crystals and angel card decks all in a box of the month. So it's like a surprise. There's even one uh, called Imperfect Foods. I, I actually buy food on one of these and they sell us all organic foods. And it's for some reason, it, it didn't make the cut to hit the shelves, but it's not bad. It's wonderful. It's, it's incredible. And like 30 bucks a week, I get a box full of food every week and, and it's great food and it's kind of a surprise and, and I don't have to go to the freaking store. So I'm saving a, a drive to the store and back and I'm saving having to go be around other people. And I get a box of cool, random, unique stuff that I want. So just huge diversity in what it can be. And what I think the viewer, what you need to listen or think about is um, where are you just super geeked out, right? Where are your interests? And I think crypto is one of those rabbit holes. I think sports betting is one of those rabbit holes. Do you spend an exorbitant? I think gaming is one of those rabbit holes, right? The world yeah. of Warcraft and the Fortnite. Of course. Of where are you spending exorbitant amounts of, of time where you just have this edge? You understand that game. You know it incredibly well. And then other people are trying to get up to speed quickly because 
a lawyer who wants to play Fortnite with his kid and wants to not get left behind may very well be interested in paying 10, 20, 30 bucks a month to get that little bit of a competitive advantage or again, the, the sports betting or all of those things. Um, you gotta remember there's a lot of people who make $150,000 a year, $200,000 a year, they don't have time to dig in and figure out what the best picks are for their fantasy football league. But if you already know that, if you're already consumed by that, or you're willing to commit to that, the byproduct of what you're already doing could be the oil well. And that's, that's kind of like, as we go on, that's the synthesis that you're looking for. That's what we want to see as the light bulb going off uh, in your mind. Yep. I would say um, uh, two, two uh, possibilities to think about with the physical products, and then I'm sure we can move on. But the physical subscriptions, there's a there's a company called Loot Crate that um, my son we bought multiple crates from them, and um, we haven't since we moved. We canceled, and we probably will resubscribe. But they send out like a pop culture gaming box every month. And my son gets a t-shirt with some kind of a meme from one of the games in it and a bunch of little trinkets. And it's just a box of useless stuff, really. Um, and he loves it, huh? Oh, dude, it's it's like Christmas morning when that yeah. gets here. And it's a big surprise, what, right? You see the box, the box is branded. And it's like the moment that comes out of the mailbox, it's um, elation. It's it's excitement. It's curiosity. It's it's that that Christmas morning being a kid moment. Yeah, well, and there's something magical about opening a package. Um, uh, you know, it, it works. And just for for um, sake of knowing how big of a market this is, I've wanted to do a box for a long time of some sort. Um, but Loot Crate was the number one company on the Inc. 5000. And I believe it was 2017. So that means they are the fastest growing private company in the United States, which is crazy to think about. But they have hundreds of thousands. I believe the number at that time was like 700,000 subscribers, active subscribers, which is crazy to think about. So, you know, subscriptions are a big, big business. You can have them as an oil well that becomes you know, it can be the, the front end of your thing or it could be the, the whole business. So there's a lot of opportunities there. So um, the next one, JVs and partnerships. So the reason I put this on as an oil well is a couple of things. Um, one is a lot of times we have, um, we have excess capacity in our things that we can either be the JV who is selling someone else's thing to our customers very passively, or we can be the person who is utilizing someone else's audience to sell our thing. And the reason I make this as an oil well is that generally speaking, if you have something like, like I just did a, a joint venture with one of my clients and he promoted our, our membership to his list. And all I did was set up a link to, to the thing and he's going to make a residual payment. I'm going to make the payment for the, 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 so, so the reason that this is an oil well is that that guy has an asset in the list. I have this active business that I'm running and he's able to do it as, you know, excess capacity for his list. I have need for more customers and like working out these partnership deals um, where you have synergies like that is a great oil well uh, thing. Um, it can be considered a traffic source depending on how you look at it, but it's also an oil well in and of itself if you set up the right ones with the right people where, for instance, um, it, it kind of crosses over with the list building data arbitrage thing on the other side, but, but it's a different use of it. Um, 
Uh, so I'll explain that in a minute, but, but and it crosses over with affiliate in a little bit. Right. But I, I would like to say, and for those who don't know, JV means joint venture. It's when yeah. kind of two separate parties come together on one thing, obviously Kevin and I, that's what this is. You're kind of watching another version of a joint venture happen in real time here. Um, but it's a way to leverage relational capital. If I was to state it another way, um, because through everything that we're doing, there's, there's physical products, there's tangible assets, there's intangible assets. And one of those is that relational capital. Um, I've been uh, on many, many podcasts as a guest. So I've gotten to meet the other doers in my space. And when I really jive with someone, I actually like look for ways that I, I'm like, how could I help this person? I really like this guy. He's great. He's got a big heart. Like, how can I, how can I, what can I do? And I start to think in this world. That's when, that's when my brain shifts into that JV world. And some people get kind of worried about competition, but the true leaders in the internet and, and the, the people who kind of like laid the path that we're all walking to this very day, it was built on joint ventures. It was built on kind of sharing the data lists and the lists around. And when you really understand what's going on, there are no competitors in this. The big dogs, they are all collaborating with each other. They're timing their things very logically to make sure they're not stepping on each other's toes. And it's 100% done consciously in sometimes it's in big events and really fancy houses. Uh, other times it's just over zoom calls, but um, just think of the idea of relational capital. You might have a lot of relationships to where sometimes you can even put two parties together and there's a lot of value for you being the JV broker in that scenario. And other people are like, I don't know a damn person. I'm off on my own. And that's perfect. It might not be for you, but it's, it's the idea of relational capital in and of itself has potential value. Yeah, and ultimately, the reason that I put this as a passive digital oil well type activity is, truthfully, you can, um, there's a lot of leverage in these type of situations if you don't turn it into a job, right? So I don't do tons of this, but occasionally when it really, really makes sense and it's someone who, like you said, is somebody that I like and respect and and there's a real win-win for everybody then then I do it and and uh and this is something that is not like maybe one of the front end ones you know like an ebook is but it's definitely a way to have you know this little thing that you spend a little bit of time on it each year and it's going to spurt out oil for you so yeah one really, really specific uh, example. There's an affiliate program that my wife and I have used extremely successfully for years in her niche. I know a lot of creators on YouTube and bloggers and Instagrammers in our niche because that's what happens when you rise up. Um, so I have been able to get 10% of their affiliate commissions by connecting them with the affiliate manager for that product. I made one connection. I got them going. I was like, hey, this offer works wonders for us. Talk to my guy over there. Get They'll get you all set up. They got set up. They mailed it. They made 10 grand. Grand, I made a grand and they're still every time they mail every time they do that's all tied in and that's one of those kind of JV partnerships where I was able to see the landscape and some people are like oh I don't want to give away my best offer to my competitors I'm like oh there's you know there's a way to make this work to where it's really beneficial for all all parties involved yeah love it all right courses so this is a big one this is one that a lot of people try to start with yeah it's which I honestly would not recommend um, because, uh, many times you can get a false positive because you have people that will buy your stuff. You have, you have pent up demand in whatever area of expertise you might have. Um, well, there's two things, two reasons I wouldn't, uh, um, advise this at first. One, I disagree with the idea that everybody's an expert. You know, there's, there's a, a piece of advice being given by someone who sells books um, about, you know, whatever. And they're telling, they're saying that everybody has a message to share with the world. Eh, not necessarily, but that doesn't mean you can't have a great online business. You don't have to, I think there's a lot of fake, fake experts out there right now who are trying to force themselves into this expert model, but they don't have, really Depends. valuable knowledge yeah. that is is worthwhile yet now you might years later after doing something for a long time but but i would i would say that courses are a very tricky uh model there there there's good money to be made selling courses of course 
Um, it's a great passive type thing, although I think over time, more and more is expected for the two grand or a thousand or whatever you're charging for your course. But I, I really think that um, uh, if you truly are someone who has something unique, then yes, it's a fantastic uh, oil well. But understand, you've got to learn how to do traffic. You really need to know how to create content that doesn't overwhelm, that actually gets a result, or you'll have big refund rates. You know, there's a lot to selling courses. Copywriting. Yep. hundred yeah. percent. There's yeah, a, lot a lot to it. To and it. it's, it's an easy idea for people to think like, oh, I create a course. It's four modules. Each module has seven lessons. So it's, it's one of those, like, it's understandable from a, a kind of overview level, but the ability to help someone else get transformation in their life, because that's what they're buying when they buy a course to help someone literally transform their lives without one-to-one -one interaction from a pre-recorded series of videos is insanely difficult. It really is. And then to write a sales letter that converts that thing also insanely difficult. And then to run the traffic and to build the trust and to build all of the mechanisms and systems, also very difficult. Now, the payoff when all of those things work correctly can be quite large. And I do want to say that many of the gurus that are talking about their million dollar launches are negating the fact that half, if more, if not more went to traffic, the other half, if not more went to JVs. And there have been documented cases of million dollar launches that net about $40,000 for the actual course creator because of all of the different payouts and all of the different hands that got padded on the way out there. So it's yeah. often kind of like, there's too big of a spotlight on it. I like to think of courses, there's a time and a place for it. A, get a result for yourself first. Okay. Make sure you can do a thing yourself. You transformed yourself first. Then can you help one or two other people do it? Right. Friends, family members, paid clients, non-paid client. Can you just, can you help other people get a result? Then generally it goes into small group. If you can help a small group, a high percentage of a small group, all get that transformation at the same time. And you've proven you did it. You help some other people do it one-on-one. -on -one. You help the small group do it. And you've already done that because there's a lot of people who they've already been doing that. And that's who we're talking to right now. If that's been your path and you're like, Miles, that's where I'm at, then course have a system. You tested it on yourself. You tested it on a few other people. You're a little batch of guinea pigs, right? And, and you lost weight and they lost weight and everybody's losing weight. And every time somebody touches this, bingo. In that scenario, you probably have it. But if you're at the coming out the starting gates and you're like, I'm going to build a course on weight loss and you ain't lost the weight yet. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're, we're, we're on the wrong page here. So just kind of a time and a place. And I think I agree it is, it is overdone and not everyone has something uh, magic and special. Um, and that's okay because those same people might be able to tell what's really cool with uh, a box of the month or there's other oil wells for those types of people. Yeah. It, like just because you're not ready to teach people some some topic and charge them thousands of dollars to teach them doesn't mean you can't build a fantastic business and be successful. I would say one of the things that is a real tricky part of the course thing is many times a person who has the success, one of two things happen. <clears throat> Either they have a, a uh, an advantage that they that their students are not going to have and they have to they have to omit that in the marketing to get the students to buy it like so, so one of the one of the ugly secrets of courses dirty secrets or whatever is that usually only like three percent of the people who buy a course get any result at all right top of the pyramid only that, that's it and and so the 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 reason for that is that it is very difficult to, to sell something for the prices that people charge for courses without omitting factors that are important in the success of the thing. Because if you really laid out, okay, this is how hard I worked to get this for years, right? Or for whatever. Oh, and I've already got a list of a hundred thousand people or whatever, like special circumstances that you have that the person who's buying the course doesn't have. 
So that's the thing. So that's the first situation that I think is a real sort of challenge and problem. And one that if you want to like really succeed long term, you don't want to you don't want to like start yourself off like doing stuff like that. That's bad business. It's bad karma. There's a lot of bad. The second one that I just want to bring up, and I'm not trying to be Mr. Negative here. I'm just trying to be real is many times people sell a course because they had a little bit of success at something, but couldn't keep it going or, or whatever. Like, like, like the, the truth is, is if, if I came up with some magic formula for printing money with Amazon, I wouldn't tell anybody about it. Right. Because I would just be printing. And everybody right. says, well, there's no competition. That's not true. There is competition, right? Um, that's why in this thing, we're teaching 16 different ways. Yeah. And there's like 10 tentacles under each of the 16. So, so truthfully, you know, with physical products, like, like there, there's, there's scale here for people to do this. But when you get into these really narrow, narrow niches, like people sell courses and they tell you that the only way, let me get to it. They tell you the only way to make money is with this really narrow thing. Then the, the truth is, is in many cases that raises my, you know, BS detector in my head because, okay, I've got this thing that's working great in this really narrow area and I'm going to teach the world about it for 1500 bucks. And um, summer. It, yeah, the, the reason you're teaching the world is because it's not as good as you really say it is. Right. It's, it, it, you had enough success to turn it into a course. So you had I'm just success to get a few of the testimonials that you need, and then let's burn the method. And it, it is has been a churn and bird thing. It's gone back from the warrior form, and and people when they sell methods as the method that works often means they've squeezed all of the juice out of that and there's nothing left. So now they can just sell the rind to you using all this fancy data. And uh, I had to write a note here. Data is manipulatable, man. Statistics are manipulatable. Yeah. I could go talk about how I grew a YouTube channel to 175,000 subscribers in under four years. I could talk about how I made 10 grand a month on YouTube within nine months because that's about how long it took for me to get to that mark. That would be uh, a true in one sense, but it would negate the fact that I've been in this online world since 2003. And from 2003 to 2010, I didn't make a damn dime. I just kept fumbling and failing. And I'm not willing to make my story sound so good that I could sell a YouTube course because look how fast I grew. Because the truth is, man, that, that clock, you got to go all the way back to 03 when that clock started. And that means from 03 till 2017, it took me to make 10 grand. And that ain't very exciting to hear, but that's the truth. And ultimately, I think that's what Kevin and I are kind of bringing is we're going to cut through the bullshit here with you guys. And we're going to let you know, there's many, many, many ways to skin cats and to shuck corn, whatever it is we're doing. And the goal is to find the one that works for you, that works with whatever you've got going on, your passions, your interests. And then you go through the full cycle and you actually get your first oil well, you get your first checks, your second check, you build a new type of income in your life. It becomes fun and exciting. And you either build off of that or you go build another one using the same process. And, and as you're going to hear, Kevin and I have a lot of these all running at the same time. And you maybe, you maybe have looked at my videos or you know he or I, you, know, you think we're kind of one dimensional, but when we dig further, we got all these things going on, multiple streams of income, multiple brands and multiple niches. And that just, that just is security on our lifestyle because platforms could shut down, niches could shut down, complete culture changes could happen. And I'm still going to be making 30, 40, 50 grand a month. I'll be able to carry my lifestyle and I don't want to live a 10 grand a month lifestyle. I like living a 20 grand a month lifestyle. And I'll be able to carry that regardless of where the world goes, because we have so many oil wells in so many different kind of uh, industries, different niches, and also in different platforms, et cetera. Um, yeah. All right. I got off, and, on, I got off I, on a tangent. And I'm not saying that courses are terrible, that everybody great. sells courses are bad, right. but you got to really be smart about that. And, and for you as a creator, this is, you know, part of the thing is, is the idea is moving from, from consumer to creator. And courses is not the easiest way to do that. No, it's not the first it, step. It is something that you want to do as like the sixth thing you do or the 10th or whatever. 
Um, so that's the, the point here. So 100% next, agree. affiliate. I'll let you start and talk about affiliate. You've done a lot more of that than me. For sure. And I think, I think it's, it's the predecessor to courses, right? Uh, can you drive traffic and, and help people buy something that's already working? Um, the cool thing about affiliate is it's a broad spectrum from software tools to newsletters, right? Like literally to courses, to all of the things that have helped you on your path as you help a group of people go on a similar path. So as I stated, get the result for yourself, help a small group of people, help people in a larger group. As you go on that path, you obviously can and should be growing an email list. You obviously can and should be reaching out to them, sharing what's working for you on that path. Gary Vaynerchuk talks about that whole uh, document, don't create idea. And we're in that realm. And I've got some issues with, with that phrase and I won't go on that tangent right now, but it <laughs> is that idea in action. And what I've chosen to do is like, I really haven't built many courses and I could have, I could have done the YouTube guru course. But instead, what I choose to do is a teach as much as I know freely to prove and demonstrate that I'm a helpful individual that's trustworthy. Then I grow my email list and bingo, the email list is the absolute mechanism for affiliate marketing. Do I have some videos that rank well and generate affiliate commissions? Absolutely. Do I run ads to some videos that generate commissions? Absolutely. But if I go in and analyze where my income comes from, I send an email to my list, I say, this thing works. It's great. It's on special till next Friday. I know it converts. I didn't have to create the product. I don't have to deal with customer support. I don't have to deal with split testing the sales copy. They handle all of that. I simply promote what I'm using and it works. And I can track my income. There is a direct correlation. My income looks like a heartbeat throughout the year. And it follows along with the number of emails that I send throughout the year. Um, I think with the world of affiliate has gotten a little bit closed minded on Amazon, you know, um, best shoes for wide feet type niche websites. And that is such a poor limited version to look at in the affiliate world. Because the way our world works, and I think Dan Kennedy had this phrase, and he said that everybody's walking around with their umbilical cord in their hand, looking for somewhere to plug it in. Um, right. Maybe stated a little bit more elegantly than that, even though it's brutally true. People are looking for helpful guides. We all use the internet. We search for answers. We search for solutions to problems. We search for ways to make our lives better. And yes, we're looking for a blog post. Yes, we're looking for information, possibly a tutorial video. Ultimately, the next layer of order of thinking, we're looking for a helpful individual who can guide us to the promised land. Literally, like everyone in the world is looking for their savior. And I wonder where that idea comes from, okay? So we have this savior complex in our culture, but you get to be the savior for that little world. Could be World of Warcraft, could be a specific game, could be crypto investing, could be any and all of these things. And what it allows you to do and why I love and I'm passionate about affiliate marketing done the right way is it allows you to grow the audience, grow your brand, grow your list and make money while doing it without the bullshit of making your own courses, without risking burning your reputation by putting out a course too early that doesn't actually work for people, maybe sell the hell out of the thing, but has a huge refund rate and you burn your reputation. And that is the absolute worst thing that you can do. Um, I think if most people looked around in their world, in their home, whatever their life is, if you got kids and you're trying to live in a chemical free home, I guarantee you, you know of window cleaning solutions, dish, what like there's all these little things in your world that you know enough about that like, these ones are nasty. Like toothpaste got all this nasty stuff in toothpaste, but you know that this tooth powder is super clean and you're not putting fluoride in your kids' kidneys because they're using whatever those things are for you, whatever you have that domain knowledge about. There's other moms who want to know that if you're in the gamer yeah. and you know the quick way to get this sword on this clan, whatever that is, man, there's other people who they want the shortcut to that. And yes, they want the shortcut. Yes, they're looking for the shortcut, but ultimately they're looking for the helpful guide and you get to meet them with a piece of content, blog post, ad, YouTube video, podcast, whatever it is, a piece of content. And then you invite them for more on your email list. And that's where the relationship goes. And as the world changes and as things go on, you get to recommend the new products you're using, the new things you tested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant way to start in this game, build the brand and the list. And then once you have the brand and the list and the trust, what do you want to make? What do they want? You could survey them. You could make a box of the month club. Bingo. You have a list to send out to your box of the month club. You can make a newsletter. Bingo. You have a list to send out to your newsletter. You, if it's time to make a course, you have that list. You have the brand. You have the trust. Selling is going to be a whole lot easier at that point in time. Um, I don't know. Uh, did I miss anything? I'm going to hop off the soapbox. Like I, I could go for a freaking hour on that. Uh, I would just say that there's affiliate programs for lots of things. 
So you can, you can be an affiliate for software tools, mm -hmm. which are very sticky. Like I, uh, there's a, there's a, a software where you can build uh, sales funnels with it that I'm an affiliate for, and I make more money as an affiliate than the software actually costs me per month. And that's honestly probably the reason that I still subscribe to it. Um, I, I don't think I even have to be a subscriber to be an affiliate, but I do just sort of yeah. as a reciprocity thing. Um, so the, so there's lots of things that, there, there's affiliates for things like, uh, as crazy as, um, uh, concert tickets or, you know, it doesn't, it's not as narrow as our internet marketing and course world, like almost everything has. <clears throat> the ability to be an affiliate for it these days. So you could be someone who has like a real sort of um, uh, commercialized type niche and yeah. audience and expertise or, or interest or curiosity, hobby, whatever, and, and be an affiliate. So that that's, um, you know, something to think about. It doesn't have to just be selling courses to people who want to market better. You know, um, there's a lot. In of fact, that. you'll find way less competition and way more opportunity when you get into the deeper niches. Like, do you really want to get in the ring with Mike Tyson is a question you should be asking yourself. And people who think I'm going to get in the make money online space and I'm going to get in the affiliate marketing space, like go for it. But you're competing with me. I got 18 years plus experience in this. I have failed so many ways that you can't imagine. I am hardened. I am strengthened. You cannot break me at this point in time. And the path and process will break most people. But yeah. if you go into the crocheting space where there is no one, how many beginners wanted to learn how to crochet recently? How, we can find this data out. And like, there's all the little bits and pieces. There's different, there's all kinds of things you could teach. If you don't give a damn about crocheting, obviously don't go into that. But I'm just, I'm using a really specific example, raising turtles, um, bird watching, bird feeders, backyard. Like, like it is the widest, most interesting world. And it allows you to really kind of get into motion to get the cash flow going to get the brand going um with God, like zero output right you need what hosting right An email list we're talking uh you know 15 20 bucks a month type overhead to get started throw some paid ads on top of that you could be growing a list right away you're testing your ideas super quick without i gotta build the course i gotta build the copy i gotta figure out fulfillment for my crochet of the box club no you don't you find a vendor who has all that dialed and you just partner with them you teach how to stuff over there to build brand and you let people know that this is the best beginner kit in the world that thing sells six seven eight nine ten times at some point you might think okay i'm selling a lot of their products as a 50 percent affiliate what if i made my own course bingo you've just doubled your margins but now you got customer support, you got sales copy, you got conversion rate optimization you have to deal with. Some point it makes sense, some point it doesn't, but it's a, a great way to kind of um, start on the path with, with minimal uh, requirements, minimal investments, very low risk way to get going. Yeah, the other thing, I, the last thing I would say about affiliate, and we'll go, just so you know, we're going to do video, individual videos about each of these areas and go deep, 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 deep on these. But yep. um, the other way to do this is if you do have, a course that's selling, especially one that's selling at volume, there are oftentimes great uh, um, affiliate programs that can be uh, that can you know be uh, non-competitive but can work really well to help your your person who bought your course, right? So, yeah. like if your course is something like from my world, say I was teaching a course on traffic and somebody else had a great course on, you know, sales. And I, you know, I could, I could refer to them and just write an email and say, Hey, this guy has a great course on sales. Some of my people buy it. I don't have the, the power of it is that you can still make great uh, money and not have to, either become the expert on something that you're not already the expert on or try to be the one-stop shop for everything for everybody like being that trusted voice that's not going to steer them wrong and curate like good stuff for them to buy like once you've entered that paying relationship with them is a valuable way to use affiliate stuff as well um you know so 
I think that's enough about that. Uh, productized services. You have anything to say about that? I've got some stuff. I'm gonna let you run with this. Um, I, I didn't thrive in the services world and I, I jumped over to the affiliate, to the digital side of things, um, but I know it's a wonderful model. Yeah, so the idea of service business is it's definitely not- An oil well. An oil well. <laughs> yeah. Service business is the farthest thing. It's an active, needs to be managed type business. However, what you can do, and I've done this um, uh, a good bit, is you can take a very specific piece of maybe the overall service that you offer and productize it. And what I mean by that is, is make it so that you can do just this one thing for people and you don't personally have to do it. You don't have to have employees that do it. You can create the process, have an outsourced worker, like a virtual assistant, and have the whole thing automated. And yeah. all you're doing is, cap is capitalizing on the demand of this thing that you have um, based on your uh, following of people. Like, in other words, if you're running a, a business and you have people that follow you, um, it, you know, for a thing, you can offer a productized service that takes zero active work once you've built this process out. And there are softwares where you can have VAs hooked up to the thing. So the order happens, it drops in, goes to the VA, they do the work, they fulfill it. And once they fulfill it, then you pay them, you've already been paid and the whole thing happens without you touching it. We have one of these called um, Premium Lists, which is a Facebook advertising thing where we build a list of potential customers for people and we use all these different pieces of software to scrape these, these names, emails, and phone numbers and addresses off of many different websites. And then we have a process of cleaning that list multiple times, testing that list to make sure these numbers are right, and so on and so forth. And we come up with this very, very high level contact rate list that you can use in Facebook advertising as a custom audience to build a group of people to advertise to. The process to figure out that thing was me doing it for myself. And then I have my team doing it. And now we have an outsource team that does it. Right. And so when someone wants that list, you know, we're, we're not in the middle anymore. All we do is we have people who know we sell it and they know my reputation that I'm not going to sell them anything that sucks. And so they buy it. And then once they do, we have an outsource team that does all the work of it. And then they deliver it and we just watch it happen. And then once they deliver it and it's, you know, QA'd by someone inside our company, which takes like 10 minutes and then they get paid and the process is done. So it's a very hands-off way to sell a specific service that, um, and, and there are people that do uh, uh, a version of this. Like there's a girl who was helping people name their uh, babies in China and uh, giving them American names or Western names. And she was doing it as a service and was helping them research what the names meant. Like they wanted someone that had the name that meant fortitude or something. And so she would research and give them the options for that. And eventually she productized this service by, by creating an algorithm that did it for them. And so a service is still happening, but it's happening by the fact that she productized it. And you can call that a SaaS. It crosses over to a simple SaaS in some ways yep. as well, but you can, you can productize it with, with, with human labor, you know, like it's pro like it, it, it becomes a, a passive activity for you if you're not doing it and you're not managing it. Right. right. And so that's what you want. 
So people are buying outcomes. Okay. They want the result. And yeah. at first you build the entire machine that makes the result. And in the, in the last video or in the first video, um, we talked about like starting with the unscalable and following that path to see where it leads you. So sometimes you're in the dirt and you're literally scraping lists and you're cl cleaning the list and you're scrubbing the list. And it's absolutely painful because it takes so many damn hours. But you know that once you figure this all out and you build a standard operating procedure, another person, some IFTTT, a few Zapiers, a few things out there, maybe a little bit of custom PHP code or something, and voila, you can actually remove yourself and the, the result happens without your input. Who cares how it happens, right? Like you build the system, right. build the machine. And that's, that's the core idea here is the user is still able to buy the result that they want. You just ain't delivering it no more because you're out enjoying your life. And that's um, sometimes we're doing the unscalable for times paying really close attention to what we're doing, what the steps we're doing, what they want, what their needs, what their uh, objections are. And all of that can lead to these types of services. Yeah. And in some respects, Sometimes, many times, uh, productized service is the bridge between service and SaaS, right? Yep. So many times it's like it starts off as a service and then it becomes a productized service, which is very passive, but then it can become self-serve, which is SaaS, which is even, you know, more automated and, and uh, whatever. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing. I think it is one of the best if you have a service business where you're delivering a thing now, it's yep. one of the best first ways to get this is your way out. Well going. Yep. This is your way out of that world. You get enough of these going, you get enough scale behind these and you can actually breathe and, and uh, the cash right. flow keeps going and you're not hitting the feeder bar every day. That's right. And, and like, I give you one more example. We have a process that we do for Facebook ads called the introvert selling system, which has like these six different areas in it. And one of the areas was making a survey and people just, you know, do a terrible job making these surveys. And so we made that a productized service for a while. And I had someone else doing the, we, I, I came up with a, a series of questions for them to fill out the answers to, and they would fill out a survey to make their survey. Right. And I had a person who would take, their answers and would just wordify it, you know, just help make the words right. Surveyify. Yeah. And, and, and so it's, it was a great thing. And, and we were charging people 1500 bucks to do something that really they were doing all the work by answering the questions I asked them. And, and it took the person who was making the words right, like maybe 20 minutes to, to clean it up. And, and so, you know, uh, 20 minutes for 1500 bucks is pretty yeah. good. And it's your magic in the process that you built through all those years of doing this, you know, relentlessly on your own. That's what they're actually buying. That's what the $1,500 was. It's not for the 15 minutes of work. It's for the, it's for that little piece of magic to sprinkle it with your magic to make it work. That's it. Um, because that's, then that's they get a survey exactly that works because right. the last surveys they did didn't work. And they, they know that you held the, the gap between here and there. That's right. That's right. So cool. ad revenue is next. Um, I think ad revenue is simple, man. It's the easiest thing in the world. You got traffic, you turn on ads, period. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I've run tests where I put ads on for about 10% of my videos, three grand a month showing up right that. But I now have all the fake gurus and some of these scammers showing ads to my people. So I think the ad world works on my wife's website. When we turn ads on the top of her sidebar and on every single post, we make four or five grand per month, but then we're distracting our audience. And on that moment, there's always a give and take. And you just need to ask yourself, is that really what you want to do? Do you really want to potentially distract your people and create more exit points from the moment? So as a standalone business building made for ad type websites that answer questions that are full of value, the wiki house of the world, it's a great business model. It works. It's absolutely proven, but are there higher and better higher and better uses for that space on your website. If you're gonna have a call to action, we can only have so many calls to action in our world. Are there higher and better uses for those calls to action to get them on your list? So you can own the relationship. So you can craft 
better offers or find more relevant offers and affiliates, I guarantee you, you'll make a whole lot more money. I make way more money with ads off on my YouTube channel to build brand and get people on my email list and then to offer them the things I know for a fact that they want and that they can trust in versus had I just turned ads on and walked away. Um, it goes beyond that, but but like from a really high level, that's you know my, my two cents. What do you yeah, got, Kevin? And I would say the only thing I would add is like my daughter has a blog that has a decent amount of traffic, not tons, but it's to the uh, teen audience. It's a music blog and she makes money from, you know, advertisers that want to advertise to that audience. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily always easy to monetize the audience that you choose because maybe they don't buy or, or whatever. But if you do have traffic, then you can, you can always monetize with ads if you have traffic. And that's, and a, that's a great point. If you don't know, uh, if you don't have a better way to monetize, if you haven't been able to figure out uh, to crack that nut, like then turning ads on, it's pretty much always going to work because retargeting ads will immediately show up and people just click, you know, where everybody's getting followed around the internet. So that's a really good point. Um, it, it is on the lower level, but it is, you know, it's the zero to one. It, it's better than nothing. If you have traffic, if you have pages on your website, mm -hmm. they get a ton of traffic, they don't convert leads, they don't convert to sales, and you still have this, this massive of bank of traffic, this is your opportunity to monetize said traffic. Yeah. The, the only other thing I would say about ad revenue, if you really wanted to go for this as a model, is I would look into areas that are against the terms of service of the ad platforms mm -hmm. for regular advertisers and create uh, assets that will generate traffic in those niches. And you can charge significantly higher rates for those. Like for instance, my daughter's blog, they, the vape companies reach out to her every month and offer about 10 X what other advertisers what pay yep. uh, for her to do it. She doesn't do it because she feels like she doesn't want to get teenagers vaping, yep. but they, the vape companies can't advertise on AdWords or Facebook right. or any of those. And so they're looking. So things like gambling, cannabis, crypto, any of those things, if you build out assets in those niches, you're going to make a lot more money with ad revenue. So absolutely. Yeah. All right. Apps, apps and games. And games. Um, I've got a few apps up and running. To be honestly, uh, to be honest with you, there was a huge boom in the app world uh, five, six years ago, right? Everything's going app. Everyone's going app. I want the user who's viewer right now, I want you to ask yourself, have you purchased in the last year a $10 app? And I want the user and the viewer to ask yourself, have you purchased in the last year? And I'm talking mobile apps here. Have you purchased a $50 app? for mobile. Um, there are some out there. It is a model that works. I have repurposed some of my MP3s. I've repurposed some of our other products in app format. It's never reached the type of cash flow and velocity. And iOS keeps updating, things keep updating. And I got to keep going back to the gall darn people who developed it because I'm not the developer to keep updating it because the, the way the iOS keeps going. So for me, from my perspective, um, <coughs> it, it became a little bit more of a headache than it was worth the, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I would say this is one that is, um, user specific, right? So like, for instance, my son loves games. He's 14. He loves to code. He, he does coding class multiple times a week and he does it on his own and yep. he's built multiple iPhone games himself and it is a passion thing. And right. the reason that I included this even because there's a lot of work to it is that there is this passive nature of building right. something that can pay you for long periods of time. He makes money from a game that he built when he was nine years old. So that, you know, I mean, it, it's not a lot. It's only like $10, $12 a month. But a, as time goes on, that trends yep. towards infinity, you know, like the return on that. And that's the power of, of uh, the, this market. And so I don't, I don't love it as an oil well, but it, but it is one. 
and we're not uh, coders you know you and i we're, we're definitely strategy guys we're not necessarily in the code for people who are in the code and i think it's another way to think of what res what have you coded for yourself what have you created for yourself that saves you time that saves you energy that, that gets a result you like, man other people might want this result um there's there's absolutely and the scale behind the itunes um app store that marketplace is massive, right? Um, yeah. The outsourcing an idea and really running that, that can be challenging. Like we, no one's going to deny that Instagram isn't a valuable app that was coded and created. Um, but that's a little beyond where we're actually at. Um, so I, I think you're right. I think people who are really interested in code, they love coding and that's, that's their passion. It makes sense. Cause then updating it, you're like, Oh yeah. All right. I get to update this, right? Like you're, you're on top of that versus me. I'm like, Oh, my app broke. Damn. Okay. I got to go fix this thing again. Like, yeah. It's definitely a specific the oil well broke. <laughs> I got to yes, go fix my damn right. oil. Well, the oil that's stopped right. flowing. It's a user thing. And I would say for the nerdy among us who do really love to dig into all this stuff, this is a great oil well, right? But for most I people, I, I wouldn't say getting into apps or games and having someone else building them is the idea. The idea is, uh, un unless you have just a killer idea that is going to serve an audience that you already have, right? But but even then, I, I think like Miles said, it's going to be more of an albatross for you than than a, a joy, you know, um, but guys do like the guy who did the, the million dollar homepage also did the call map and, yep. you know, like how crazy is that? He built it as a desktop app for himself at first, and then it became the call map. And now he's like worth hundreds of millions because of that. So, you know, who knows, right. Um, royalties, licensing, and certifications. Um, the idea here is that you might have some content that other people want to use and you can get paid a royalty for letting other people use it, a licensing fee, or you can certify them to use your content. Like I have advertising methods that I have invented that other people want to use in their agencies. And <clears throat> excuse me, I just let them use it. Um, but if I wanted to, I could create a certification program and have a Kevin certified agency to do introvert selling system or yeah. our Hydra or whatever. Um, and people have offered to pay me for that, but I, I you know, I don't really necessarily want to be like there, there's a yin and yang to it, but it's a very passive thing, right? Like you can, um, you can charge licensing. Uh, there's, uh, people that make content just for licensing. Um, yeah. They know that they can, you know, have people using it. So any thoughts on that? Yeah. So my wife and I, we have a couple of books that have been picked up by international publishers and they have translated our books and we earn fees for that. And we do nothing like literally they're like, we like your book. We think it'll sell in our country. We think it'll sell in our language. Can we license it from you? And we sign a licensing agreement with it and we earn income for all of the sales. Generally there's an upfront and for the sales. So it's something that can plug on to what you're already doing, right? Big companies are known to license recipes. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's small beverages that have been bought out by major companies. What do they actually buy? The intellectual property of the, the recipe itself. Um, so there, there's a lot of ways these kinds of deals can, can work out, but generally you, you have to have something of value. So it's, it's usually like a later in the oil field type of a scenario. And on the certifications, um, you look at someone like Brendan Burchard who certifies life coaches. He's a life coach. He loves life coaching. It is, you, you could just tell, um, it's like his favorite thing to do. He, he loves it to a huge depth. Me, I would not, I've, I've asked for certifications on my way to do SEO and I've just, I don't want to deal with it. I don't like that kind of a, I, I, there's something about it that doesn't work for me. So it's, it's kind of a, for the right type of person who has the ability to get or create a specific type of a result. It's an option. And for the um, international book royalty deals, they found us, right? So we, we focused on crafting great products and moving our way up to the top of our categories on the Amazon rankings through basic optimization and running countdowns and doing some, some simple, simple marketing on those platforms. What do you think the big book publishers in other countries are looking at? They're looking at the top US books in their niche. And when they find one they think that, that would work, they just reach out and it was actually a really simple deal to do. So to me, it was almost like a byproduct of something that popped up um, kind of out of left field for us and, and uh, make sure you have some contact information in all of your books. Yeah. So it's, it, again, this is one of the more passive um, ways to, to make, you know, 
money uh, as an oil well. It's it's usually unless you just hit the jackpot, not going to be life changing money. But but it's it's great. I mean, this is like you know something that could make your car payment or your house payment or whatever. You know, I mean, it's it's real money and uh and there's usually no work on your part which is the nice part it's found money it's just found yeah. money found money so tools um so so i know that some of these things we could probably group together but i just felt like you can make them simpler than having to group them together so tools yep. could be SaaS. Yep. but what i'm thinking about with tools and these are things that we've sold uh we have little tiny simple uh, things that we use in our business every day that we use um, and people want, right? Like calculators that we build, um, uh, you know, um, uh, worksheets that we use, um, you know, like processes that we have, um, uh, um, so on and so forth. I don't want to cross over into templates because that's a thing too. But like we have all sorts of little tools that we use in our business and people, you know, they're like, hey, can I buy that? You know, and so yeah. they, they want to buy it. We usually sell them for cheap, but what, what we use them for is a way to get a new customer in the door many times, you know, which yep. is great. And, but, but I think building tools and selling tools is a great business model as well. And it's often a byproduct of what you're doing. Uh, so I think the big example that's probably more of an, a SaaS example is Basecamp. I mean, he literally was just fed up with project management softwares that were out there. They built an internal tool for themselves to keep project management on, on track for their, I believe it was a web design company at the time. And, and that tool has made just gazillions more than their web design thing because it was the tool itself. <clears throat> It, to simplify it down to something that's probably more in the grasp, um, I, I think of spreadsheets, spreadsheets that run certain types of calculations, spreadsheets that do certain things <coughs> that you just punch in your PL, your this and your that, your XYZ, and the spreadsheet. So it's, it's essentially kind of almost buying an algorithm, it's buying a mathematical equation that is preset in a way that enter numbers that you have accessible and you get the output over here. And those types of spreadsheets sell um, everything from CPAs and business builders all the way to um, how to pay off your debt type stuff and budgeting type stuff. You can even see on Etsy. Um, if you type in budgeting on Etsy or like a budget spreadsheet on Etsy, they sell on Etsy, not to mention that they sell from individual people's websites. And, you know, is, is that technically a software? It's kind of in the gray area, but it's, it's a thing that gets a result that was useful for me, right? Because me and my team needed to get this specific result over and over, would other people like to buy this? And I think that that uh, Basecamp proves that that idea can actually be way, 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 way bigger than most of us uh, possibly had previously thought. Um, yeah. Personally, I have I have tools in the SEO world. Um, I'm building my own. You know, that's SaaS, but like. Um, Pulling data out of keyword, uh, out of Google search console is notoriously difficult. Monitoring and managing uh, percent changes on, on click-through rates and things like that is notoriously difficult. So I'm building tools that my team uses to help us analyze our SEO. Would other people like to buy this tool from me? Absolutely. Um, is it the highest on my roadmap? No, but that's another story. Yeah, so a um, couple of other examples. The reason that I didn't put this in with SaaS, I just remembered um, is, so I had a script that we wrote years ago that would rotate a link. And mm -hmm. it's not something that somebody's going to pay me a monthly subscription for, right. but people pay me $19 for it. And yep. I wrote that script so that I could rotate at different points in one of my funnels. I would want to test, I was sending a lot of traffic, right? And this was before some of the built-in tools for Facebook and Google that, that are there now, but I wanted to rotate the shopping cart. And part of it was, I there, there were two reasons I wanted to rotate the shopping cart. First off, I was testing different versions of the cart to see which one converted the highest. When you're sending 10,000 clicks a day to a site, it makes a difference if your yeah. cart works right or not. You know, 12% um, to 16% conversion rate makes a big difference at that volume. That's right. And the second thing is at the same time, I wanted to do a thing called load balancing with my merchant accounts and ClickBank was one of them. And, and so what I wanted to have is once I, once the cart went out, I wanted to run three carts at the same time. 
and each user get the different cart as it's as they visit the site. And there was nothing. There's no way to do that. And so right. we wrote a little script and installed it on our server and did it. And uh, and so that was a tool that people use, you know. So I think scripts and little cl clips of software that you are little clips of code that you write that like there's scripts for Google AdWords that we've written for ourselves that that I don't sell them. But if if I okay. did, people would buy yeah. them, you know, yep. Th things like that. So those are great oil wells um, for tools. Um, site rental and lead gen. Rank this and is rent. One that's a big biz op for the, the world right now. And yeah. A dozen and I call it, I call it the rank and rent. And as a search engine <laughs> optimization guy, as a keyword research geek, um, the theory here is that you go build out um, chiropractors in Tulsa.net and you rank it number one in Google. So it gets all of the traffic. You start generating leads. You send a few leads to your local chiropractors. Be like, call them up three days later. Hey, I've sent you five leads. Did any of them convert? They're like, yeah, who are you? You're like, oh, I own this site. Would you like to rent it from me for 500 bucks a month, thousand bucks a month? It's another one of those ideas like courses that's really easy to explain. So it sounds very enticing. And the devil is in the details. And there's a lot of pains in the necks and there's a lot of risk. And there's a lot of BS that you have to deal with in this world. Um, I personally would recommend people go in the direction of build your own brand, build your own list based on helping people get results, uh, whether that's through affiliates, it's a much better, longer path. But if you a have a portfolio of sites already that are ranking that you don't want anything to do with them anymore, that can make sense. And B, if you just happen to be a local SEO, you know, the Google, my business platform, you know, citations like the back of your hand, and you have a team and systems to crank thing, these things out. I think there's a potential of this working, but you're always going to have massive platform risk with Google's algorithm changes, which are nonstop. And they've been nonstop for 15 years now, and they will always be. And the day that you have 26 of these things ranking and you're making 500 bucks a month from each of them, and you think you're a boss and Google goes and makes one change to their algorithm and that shit all disappears and all your clients call you and your income disappears because your sites went from number one to number seven, uh, boy, that that is potentially a bad day. So there is a risk on the other side of that that is outside of our control, which is why it's not a business model that I've gone after, even though I, I technically have all of the skills to dominate in that kind of a world. Yeah, I would say that, <clears throat> so I had um, a business doing this back in the like 2010-ish time. And we had mm, hundreds of sites and, and um, what we were doing that was interesting is we were um, undercharging for them on purpose. Um, and th the idea being that these were like my, my thinking on it, <clears throat> here, here's the pro of it. People say that real estate investing is passive income. I've owned, at one point, I owned 23 houses at the same time. There was nothing passive about no, that business. It was the job. worst business I've ever had. Um, Being a landlord is rough. It was the worst ever. And the idea, if you don't own them outright, which I didn't, is you, you can make $200 a month um, per house, you know, and yet you go into all this debt or you have other people in debt or there's many ways to do it. I don't want to go on leverage. There's leverage somewhere. Yeah. And uh, whereas with these sites, you can, you can build a monster that will build sites that you can rent out for a hundred dollars a month or $200 a month. And, and the, the value of the sites as much as the, the leads they're getting is that it's a, there's a lot of reasons to do it but i think that thinking like you're thinking on it has to be right and and the reason that you're thinking has to be right is you have to understand that it's like a get rich slow type thing and you're building this snowball effect that the longer you have these sites and the longer that you do the work on these sites, not you, maybe, maybe as someone who you're paying to do that stuff, like a, an outsource worker or something, they get stronger over time. And, and so there's, there's, there's value to that, but it's a very, it's a very, you need to be patient. And if you, 
if like what Miles was saying, if you're renting them out for 500 a month, I know a guy who rents, rents them out, makes these amazing sites and rents them out for 2,500 a month. Um, if you're doing that, it's very active and it becomes an active business. If you can rent them out at a price point where it's, it's a, a no breakage model for the end user. Yep, got it. And if they get one call a year that turns into a client, it's worth it for them. Then it can be, I think, a useful uh, oil well. So there's, there's be- a ton of data. So I, I think... If you're a SEO geek, if you love the idea of keyword research and putting up, you know, you don't have to put up huge websites to rank for chiropractor Tulsa, right? Uh, you're targeting, uh, you know, medium-sized cities, uh, but really ultimately it takes a certain personality type. I think there's more value for most people committing to an audience and committing to that audience, helping them solve problems and go on a longer journey versus the chiropractor site, the yoga site, the restaurant site, like all of these. So what you're doing is you're creating a wider base versus going deeper with a single audience. And it's just a different choice. Um, yeah. I just wanted to dispel the, there's a lot of hype around how uh, of course, easy yeah. of a business no, model it is. Yeah. And so the average, one of the data point I have is the average uh, website ranking on the number one spot on Google is like four years old. It might've been top three was like four years old. You're going to be starting all brand new websites. So you, you have to have that, that I'm building assets. I'm going to build a lot of little assets over long periods of time. It absolutely is a doable, workable, proven model. Um, just not necessarily my, my first go-to. Yeah, agreed. And 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 the person who wants that business is a grinder, right? Hundred percent. So, so that you don't want to talk to people, you want to just do your work and do the thing. And and but there is a a true oil well nature to it in that the the work that you do on these sites once you get them done. Because I've I've got in my test prep stuff, you know, we get a lot of traffic to those sites organically, and it's because they're old. And we did a bunch of work at the beginning and wrote 200 articles that were each a thousand words long when we started the sites, those, you know, over time they get love, you know? And, yeah. and uh, so anyways, um, I, I just wanted to say that the way that people tell you it works is yeah. not necessarily the truth of it, but there is a model there. And they're, so- they're giving you the glimpse, not necessarily the full story. Also real quick. So on your, um, on your test prep website, uh, you're also selling leads from a part of that, the, the quiz that's in there, correct? So, so this is, so the, the selling leads part, it's kind of like, what is the output of what you're doing and how can that maybe value someone else? A really good example of this is if you're, you're in the real estate space, if you have a bunch of traffic coming for real estate and you're selling leads to a local um, mortgage broker, right? Like yeah. uh, those leads are extremely valuable. You don't offer that service yourself. Um, it can, it can just kind of position you further as being the helpful guide in that space. And that kind of um, call to action embedded in your content is going to be way more valuable for you and your relationships locally with the other vendors than putting up a freaking ad that's going to be that thing they looked up on Amazon. So th- there's other ways to incorporate lead gen into um, more of what you have going on. And, and it's that kind of like where you have traffic, there's there's always opportunity if you just start to think a little. Yeah, uh, and it crosses over in the JVs and partnerships area 100%. too. percent which yep. is actually why I put JVs on here is, and I'm remembering a lot of this now as we're talking, but, um, you know, universities buy my leads because the people are trying to pass career tests. And so um, it's, it's excess, it's excess capacity for me. Like I don't, I, I don't ha- I'm not doing anything else with these leads. And so I'm able to sell them to them and it's found money for me and it's in the course of what I'm already doing. So that's it's very simple and straightforward. It's a question of like, are you interested in, uh, how do you word that question? It was, it was brilliantly worded. It's are like you, a one-liner. Yeah, are, are you open to going to, going to school? Yeah. <laughs> Yes or no. And if they tick yes, that whole lead from that lead capture system goes, it just gets split off and sent out to another place and somebody pays for it. Yeah. What we do is we add in, uh, we drop in an extra couple of questions if they say yes, and then it gets sent to the school. And if not, then that never happens and it never doesn't get sent. Yep. All right. Next up is templates. And I think templates are brilliant. Um, We all have things we're doing from standard operating procedure type templates to flat out copywriting templates and one click upsell script templates. And I've seen Facebook ad templates. And um, oftentimes templates don't work as great as advertising. 
baptized as someone who's purchased a snot nose amount of them. Uh, that's supposed to be a large number. I spent a lot of money on templates and, mm -hmm. um, you know, a few ideas good here. It helps to maybe not have a blank page to start with, but they rarely work as great as they sound. But from a vendor perspective, as the person selling the templates, it is one of those really, really powerful ideas that's really exciting to your audience member because it just feels like the absolute shortcut. It's the absolute easy button. I could put together a package I've sent to probably a thousand emails to my list. I could package up my 10 or a hundred most valuable emails, my most valuable subject lines, the subject lines that I have, the data that says, these are all my subject lines that got over a 30% click through rate. These are my best subject lines, 997. I could sell all my subject lines. I could even go farther than that. So the, the idea for you as a business owner is, is where are you kind of leveraging templates or where are you leveraging things that are working really well for you that other people would love to have? Um, you know, uh, Doberman Dan, who's a copywriter, that you probably know he's there in Florida. Um, he sells the 60 minute copy cure. It's, it's a pack of like 10 or 12 uh, templates. Um, Terry Dean, who's also in Florida, um, he sells his email templates and, and on and on and on. It is, it's an irresistible offer. A lot of times yeah, position correctly. Are one of the best offers to me, I would buy your email templates in a second, right? I mean, I, I you know, it's like that, that's the kind of stuff that, that it's, it's, uh, it, it, like you said, it's an irresistible offer. And when you know the person has put in their 10,000 hours, <clears throat> it's a shortcut. It's a, yep. it's even, I, I don't usually use the templates straight out when I buy them. I, I tweak them a little bit to put my, my voice in there. It's an like idea Kevin. generator. It's like, yeah. a, ooh, like you're looking at the hook. It's more about like, like, so that's, we look at it. We understand how to use them. It's like, why did this work is what that's we right. want to know. And then we under, we, we extract the essence of it and we, we make it ours versus yep. literally like fill in the blank. Um, quick shout out to Roberto Blake, who has half a million subscribers on YouTube. He teaches YouTube. Um, I bought his YouTube thumbnail templates because God, I got to keep th coming up with thumbnails, right? And here's the easy button, Photoshop files. I just put my picture in and put my text on and voila, my thumbnails are done. And so he good. has so many more subscribers than I do. I just trust that his thumbnails work better than mine because obviously look how many subscribers he has. It, it was an, like 97 bucks. Boom. I was like, where's my credit card? Let's do this. Um, well, the nice thing offer. about templates too, is that you many times get a really good customer from that which is useful for all your other stuff, right? Like- Because so, they get results. Yeah. Well, and, and it's someone who's looking for a very specific thing in many cases, which is usually like a really good customer. Like if someone is looking for email templates, then that presumes that they probably have someone already on a list to email to. They've got traffic, they've got a site, they've got a landing page. Okay, I got you. So, so you're saying that by selling the templates, it's actually identifying segments of my audience who are farther along the path. Therefore, they're more willing to invest in other things too. That's right. Brilliant. Good customers, Brilliant. right? Yep. And so that's the, the, like the, the nice thing about templates is that they are good offers on sites where it's hard sometimes to, like YouTube, where sometimes it's hard to... Um, to find the very right person because the audience is very broad, even Facebook in some ways with the bigger audiences. But if you have a very specific template, the person who's going to buy that is going to, you know, they self-identify. Like if I, if I'm selling a, a, a Facebook ads template and somebody buys it, then odds are there's someone who's already running Facebook ads, not yeah. someone who is about to set up their account. Right. And th there's just a lot of value to, to identifying that, that buyer. So makes sense. Cool. List building data arbitrage. Um, this one's you. Yeah. So, so there are traffic businesses and there are people that run businesses that the whole point of the business is the list. And there are guys who do this in the JV world as the list owner. Um, but what I'm getting at is that there are ways, there are bigger companies, smarter companies. And, and I think on a smaller scale, like I've done this in some respects with my test prep stuff, um, when, you're, when you're building lists that have other value, you can rent the data from that list to other people and make money just 
from the rental fee. You don't have to be the affiliate. There are people that will pay you $1,000 to send out an email to your list or $5,000 or $50,000, depending on who's on that list and what, you know, how many people and how many opens and all that sort of stuff. Very good passive business because all you got to do is solve how to get the right people on that list one time and then just run that. And, and it's, 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 it's sort of like this niche traffic strategy, but that I think personally, it is going to be more and more important in the coming years with all the stuff that's happening with GDPR and all the, the different uh, privacy things on the platforms. I think that ad platforms like Facebook are going to become less and less uh, able to do the targeting that they've been doing. And so if you own a list of people, that's my ideal audience, I'm going to have to pay you yeah. to put my message in front of them. And we're almost full circle back to, I would say like the origins of direct response marketing, the direct mail world. Uh, the list was everything, right? And the list brokers manage the list and you can get list of people who subscribe to certain magazines and yep. they have all these data. So some of the data he's talking about is like the recency number, right? Are these customers from within the last 30 days? Are these people who bought something in the last 90 days? The more recent, the better. And this is literally, this is the roots of our industry is it came down to these lists. I think, um, what is it? Next list uh, and then Next USA list. Nextmark is one. You can still go look at Nextmark as a list broker to see how kind of the old school is still working to this very day. But this is why I think you and I both focus, Kevin, on, on building our lists. So I'm building our, our lead list and our uh, our customer list because the customer list is more valuable. But when I'm saying on the, the rank and rent one, I'm like, ah, go build your own list, go get your audience. It's because the inherent value of that asset that is the list has so many directions that it can spin off cash flow. Um, not that person and I would ever like rent out my wife's list by any means, but it's like, it's that, that feather. It's like the, the, if all else failed, it's always there. If we needed to, um, it's, yeah, it's a powerful could, model. If you, if you needed to make a quick hundred grand to get, to flee the country, you could, you could send out 20 emails and make that hundred grand renting that list or selling that list or whatever. Right. right? I mean, that's, that's the thing. So so it's a it's a it's an interesting business. It's certainly probably more of an advanced strategy, but the people who own those lists have massive oil wells that are, you know, there's not a lot of work involved in in it at this point, but they but they are going to spit out money forever. So yep. simple SaaS. Um, I can give you two examples of ones that I um, have and am working on. I know you've got one too. Like I think SaaS is one of these octopus type things. You can have all the tentacles wrap around you and it become a monster, or you can make it do one thing super well and charge a cheap price for it and have people use it, right? So um, we're working on one that is a survey software that is simple and easy to use. Like I think everybody makes their survey software way too complex and they put in like 50,000 options and make it unusable. So nobody can ever actually make, make one that like, like you don't need like all this predictive node stuff in a simple survey. All you need is five good questions, right? So, so we're making one that will be like, you know, less choices, less flexibility. And, and all that stuff. And we're going to charge like 20 bucks a month for it, but it's going to convert leads, which is what you really want. Right. So, so that's one. And it's, and, and, and the reason I call it a simple SaaS is I don't want to have something where I've got to have a dev team of 20 people working on it all the time and all this sort of stuff. It's an oil well, it's going to be something that I can sell to the people who already follow me, who are frustrated with all the crappy softwares that are out there for this thing. The second thing that I'm doing with this with this survey tool is it's going to be mobile first. So the the idea is most of these survey softwares are crappy on mobile and ours is going to look and work really well on mobile. And that's the two things I know that I need. So that's why I'm building it. And I've got I'm I'm personally am subscribed yearly to probably 
eight different survey softwares and none of them are great. And nah. they all have their own problems. I've and tried like five or six of them. And like, every time I'm like, this is, this is way more confusing than it needs to be. Like, yeah, I'm, it's like, how am I still in it. this? It should be live. That's right. It should take you 10 minutes to set it up max. Yeah. And, and they make it so that you've got to like go through 20 videos to figure out how to do it. It's ridiculous. And so yeah. there's only a few things you need. The second one that we're doing is this thing called the ad vault. And it is just all the ads I've saved over you know, years and years of saving ads that I saw that were good on digital things like Google AdWords, YouTube, Facebook. And now we are building our own repository of those that's searchable. And it's going to be simple. Like the, the whole use of it is for you to get inspiration for making your own ads on Facebook or YouTube or Google or Instagram. And, and it's going to be like just a one simple use case again, low price point, like 50 bucks a month. Uh, we could charge a lot more and add a lot more bells and whistles to it, but we don't want to, right? And because uh, I think the value is is the data that's going to be in there. And so that's just two simple SASs. And those are very passive. Like it's taking a lot of work on the front end to build these, but once it's done, because of the simplicity of what we're willing to offer people, a la Basecamp, our, our development, is is going to not be crazy going forward right and i think it's interesting to think about so the ad vault right um you could have made an ebook right there could be a an ad um swipe copy type ebook there there's a potential for templatizing all of those and the software so yet again we have this kind of like you look at a lot of ads. It's a byproduct of your of your professional kind of uh, commitment and endeavors. And how does that byproduct manifest for you? And I think the the SaaS is something that's going to be able to be updated by. It's going to be simple. It's going to be elegant. It's going to be very easy. It's probably going to be the most functional version of all of that. Um, but yet there were all these other options and ways to leverage this kind of insight that you have, or even just just these these hours of research um, that yeah. you have into a number of different ones that you made a conscious decision that this is the right oil well for this kind of little section of what I'm doing because nobody's doing that well. Um, so I'm working on a keyword research tool right now. Uh, the keyword research tool I promote as an affiliate, I've promoted them. Uh, I've sent them thousands of customers. I've earned uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in commissions from this company and their price point is pretty high. I'm going to be honest with you at, nine, at $49 per month starting out. I think that's if you pay yearly. I think it's actually even higher if you pay monthly for a huge segment of my audience. Um, who are maybe starting their first blog, who are bootstrapping it just like I did. That's a lot of money, right? And that money could be spent uh, very, very intelligently in other places. So my theory is, can I create a simpler version that has a simpler UI that still gets the data and the results that they need, but can I do it for 20 bucks a month? I'm so confident that I can. And once this code base is there, we're buying data from a few sources. Um, my integration guy's son just graduated college with a computer science degree. So I've got literally, he's fr I, I, like, he's fresh out of college and he's very inexpensive for what he's doing. I'm mildly in over my head on this. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I'm going, I'm doing something that's a little bit more complex. We're pulling data from five or six different API sources, blah, blah, blah. But I am such a keyword research geek. Keyword research is what has made my wife and my success what it is. It's why my wife's websites reached 40 million plus people. It is like a part of the Miles Beckler ethos and brand. And I have 175,000 subscribers on YouTube right now. Many of them know me for blogging, content marketing, driving traffic from Google and keyword research. So mm -hmm. it fits and it's it's actually a challenge that I'm enjoying right now. I don't code at all, but I'm, I'm doing these weird mock-up things. So I find it to be very fun. I would not recommend somebody goes this far down. Um, I have created other simple things like title tools that allow me to type in a title and type in a description and look at it next to the top 10 results on Google, just because I want to see what my title and what my description would look like sitting on Google compared to the actual results on Google. So I started very simply on some of these and I added them to a membership. Okay. So my first software tools, I just tacked them on to a membership. So I was making 12, $15,000 a month from my membership. And I decided to take a portion of that money and put it into creating software tools for them. 
so I could stop answering the same questions because I knew there was a mechanical way to do that. So that was kind of how my path into software happened. And now that I have experience working with this guy, we've created a few other tools, um, like how to uh, SEO publishing tools, et cetera. I'm like, let's take on the keyword research world. Now I know that it's a multi-million dollar a year potential in the right tool, but I'm gonna have to get deep into the weeds of UI and UX and it's gonna have to be beautiful. I don't really wanna do that. So I'm gonna make it cheap and super useful and promote the bejeebas out of it as a better, simpler, less expensive alternative because most of the tools are 99, 50 to hundred bucks a month. And if I can come up with a tool that gets the result they want for 20, seem, seems worth it to me. Um, obviously there's a risk in that and I'll, I'll obviously keep you updated on, on how that well that works, but it's, it's, it's a little bit of a passion project for me at this point in time. Um, I think software is great, especially for coders as well. Uh, if you're into code, if you're, if you love it, if you love the bootstrap and the Ruby and the PHP stuff, um, I think WordPress plugins are, there's such an opportunity in the world of WordPress plugins and helping people, um, get specific results off of their WordPress websites. I think it's a huge area. If I was a coder, I'd I would, I would think of plugins as a tool, but yes, because there's not a subscription to it, but got it. But, but I, I, I would say two things. One is the best SASs, I believe, are when you're solving your own problem. Yeah. And you're in a in a work environment where you just are bugged by something all the time. Totally. And like both of the ones that I'm doing, it's like these were this was my own work, right? So like the the ad vault is it I had a spreadsheet with a thousand plus of these ads on it, right? And I just would use it when I was thinking about how, what, what ad to write for a client or myself. And, and so, it, and, and people started knowing that I had it and wanted it. And I didn't really want to share my spreadsheet, you know, cause it's kind of like, I don't know. Um, so this is a way to do that. Right. And then the second one with the survey, I, I gave you all the problems I have with the survey software out there. I will say, that I think that a great tool that does one thing well, like really well and right, is 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 a way better thing than a, a Swiss Army a, knife. A, something that's trying to do everything. And that 100%. that I think would be the the mistake that a coder or someone who like loves the code who is who is looking for ideas versus the person who works in the field and is and is solving their own problem. You know, the one thing that you, I'd say most of the time for software tools, people only use less than 20% of the functionality yeah. of the software tool. And so if you could build one that only does the 20%, then they're never gonna be able to compete with you on price and your customers are gonna use it. And when they're using it, they keep it. I 100% so, agree with that. And, and so I'm, I'm not a SaaS trainer. I'm just telling you as a user. Right. So I don't use in, in my business, I have very specific tools for each part of my business, right? So my, I'm putting on my consumer hat right now. Um, my shopping cart is not a funnel tool. It's a shopping cart. That's and right. what it does at the shopping cart level is perfect. It, it is excellent at being a shop cart. My landing page software is a landing page software and that's just what it is. And that's what it was built as. And it is bulletproof my WordPress site that drives traffic is completely optimized for that one task. I don't let my WordPress site run my, write everything in my business. My, my learning management system where I deliver is different from my WordPress website. They're all super special. And what happens when I've built my business this way, they're all wonderful. They all create a wonderful user experience for my people and they're freaking bulletproof. And as yeah, long they as they break. directly- They don't break because they, you don't have- They don't to break, use. right? Because when something tries to be it's not yeah. doing a million things, right? When yeah. they're when they're not trying to be everything, they don't. They're not full of bugs. They don't break, and they can handle. We run thousands of transactions per month from them, yeah. right? And I need them to be. I, I, they cannot miss a day. They can't miss an hour because um, that that means missing out on money. And so I love buying specialized tools. I 100% agree with you. I think too many people are like, well, I could I could hot glue some some crystals on it. I could be dazzle it over here. I could be That's jewel true. it. And they end up putting a bunch of half-assed things on it, and it actually dilutes the value, even though the is still there, but now that it's got all this other stuff, I'm like, ah, I, don't, I don't really like this thing. I just want it to do one thing, do, do that one thing perfectly. 
and that's it. In, in the kitchen, I got a chef's knife. It was, I paid, I paid a bunch for the chef's knife. Boy, you bust that thing out. It ain't no chop block can do this, that, the other. It is, it is, it is a wonder and a beauty to use in that moment. Yeah, you're not cutting limbs tool. off the tree outside, right? Yeah, right. Um, cool. So last one is physical products. Uh, we're going on two hours here. So I, I figured it's good for us to close out with the lengthiest one. <laughs> That's it. Uh, um, so physical products, again, um, this can be like, you can make this as big or small as you want. It can be as simple as print on demand t-shirts being sold through Etsy that you never touch anything to as, as you know, complex as you have your own warehouse full of stuff. Um, obviously your own warehouse full of stuff is not going to be more much of a digital oil well, but what I've found through the years is that many times something that starts off as a digital oil well might end up morphing into a real active business for you yeah. because there's so much, you, you discover demand and a market and a business, right? So right. that's the, the yin and yang of it. But I think that physical products is actually one of the easiest and yeah. best ways to go from being a, a buyer to being a seller, to yeah. from consumer to creator. To yeah. It's yeah. it's one of the quickest people buy, man, I wish it was like this 20 years ago. Um, it was so much harder back then, but nowadays people are conditioned to buy off the internet and they'll buy off hundreds of different platforms anywhere from amazon to ebay to etsy to all the print on demand sites they'll buy from from almost anywhere and and all you got to have is a good idea right yeah. so that's the power of it and shopify remembers my checkout information even when i go to a different shopify store now right so like i think i think we are absolutely in a golden era of physical products online and i think it is a better time now to be in that space than it was when we were both getting started because trust we've 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 crossed the bridge of trust and people are just yeah i put my credit card in online i just buy things online that's just what i do apple pay google pay uh paypal if i don't want to put my credit card information it's all there um well, I had I had the largest airsoft gun site on the internet in the early 2000s, and it was just cracking seven figures in sales. You yep. know, I'd say the biggest one now probably does 20 times that or something, right. maybe even more. Right. And it's part of the problem was people didn't want to buy stuff off the internet back in 2003. Right. You know, so it's uh, um, it's just a different day and age and era. So people, it is. they're conditioned now, which is great. Yeah. And, and you got to be, you know, cognizant of the margins, right? The cost of goods sold. There's, there's more levels to it at this point, but humans, we humans, Americans, uh, Westerners are more comfortable buying physical things than we are digital things. Okay. Somebody's going to buy a airsoft gun or a thing that fills a need, a new kitchen knife. I'm going to buy a new kitchen knife before I buy a how to cook class online in some modulated learning management system. We, we buy physical things a lot. And if you go way, 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 way back in history of wealth, wealth has always been created by buying and selling things. So in the physical product world, you don't have to invent things. You literally can buy things and sell them in different places. You can purchase used things from one place and you can sell them in another place. You can purchase large amounts of things. And he's showing off his uh, hustler secret, which is uh, there's, there's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like literally. So he's having that created and made. It was originally packaged in skull chewing tobacco cans. And now it's all in its fancy own can. It's been a process. Um, I know people who have purchased logs of soap. These are like full big bar, huge, not bars, they're logs of soap. And they cut them up into bars and they put their own fancy little wrappers on them. And then they take them down to the farmer's market and they sell their seven, eight, nine dollar soaps that they bought off of Etsy from a log. So they're buying a big amount. They're doing a little bit of in-between work, slap a brand on it. Voila, they have their own product. Buying, you flipping used things is huge. As he was saying, the print on demand, right? Creating a, a, a meme, ta uh, following a trend, creating a meme, running ads to those kinds of things. It's easier than ever before. 
it's noteworthy that a lot of, we've seen a lot of digital product people shift into supplements. Uh, Brendan Burchard has his own nootropic line, which is like brain health stuff. We've seen um, bosses uh, in, in the world go from how to lose weight stuff to actual supplement stuff. And even on ClickBank, there's some really, really, really high end products, not high end. Um, there's some, they're expensive as hell. Um, some greens type products. These people aren't making these products. They're fulfilled. They're, there's companies out there that specialize in giving you a white label formula and filling your thing, all you do is supply the label. Frank Kern even recently started a skincare line for his wife. They literally contacted a company that already does skincare. That it's probably one of the three companies that make skincares for all the brand names that you know of. They gave them a logo. They said, here's the recipe we want, voila. And do you know how much skincare stuff is sold? I mean, to the tune of tens of millions from our uh, Cindy Joseph, uh, our friends over at Smart Marketer uh, with Ezra Firestone. And they're, they're selling tens of millions of, and it's like chapstick skincare stuff. So the world of physical products is possibly the most interesting it can overlap with a lot of them. It's got a few nuances, but remember shifting into becoming a merchant and ultimately helping people get what they want, what they need, what they feel they need. It's going to be easier in the physical product world than anywhere else. And I like leveraging with my email list that we build, we sell physical products. Some of them are our own products that we create and have fulfilled by third-party companies. The fulfillment game is easier today than it ever has been. Some of them I sell as an affiliate. And I'm like, these physical products are the absolute best one. My wife sells a ton of jewelry and other things that her audience loves. So, so the physical products can fit into your business in a number of different ways. Um, stay open to that idea and start to think if you are interested in this, Go looking on the different platforms, on the Etsy's, the Ebay's, go look at what some of the best sellers are in the worlds of things that you're currently interested in. Um, as I mentioned, my, my lady uh, who does quilting stuff, selling fabrics left and right across the country. Um, we live in that age. And I think that that the, the physical products are something we're going to talk a lot about in future videos, right? Like I think this is really, that's what kind of, I think we saved the best for last in some regards because it's, it's the easiest to help you shift the gap, bridge the gap, to get into... I'm selling things. I'm a vendor. I'm a merchant. I'm not just a consumer. I'm now on both sides of the equation. And that even though it might seem small to make your first few sales of, of something through the eBay app that you found that you know has value, uh, but that is actually a transformational uh, step on your path to being a successful long-term entrepreneur. Yeah, I would say the, the problem with physical products is there's a cost of goods sold associated yep. with having a physical product. So it brings your margins down. The, the power of having a physical product is that there's, there's probably no easier way to transition from consumer to merchant. I, I would say you, you could sell, um, you know, like, like in our first uh, beta group of the digital oil wells program, you know, we had a girl who there was a, a crypto meme going around about Dogecoin. She made a t-shirt and made sales the, like, like had the idea from idea to money in her bank account was the same day. There's, there's nothing like that. You can't do that with a course. You can't do that with a newsletter, you know, like that, that you, you can't write a book or an ebook that fast. That, that is the power of this. And the, the, you know, at the highest level, people like Kylie Jenner are, are making billion dollar companies and, you know, she's, she's cap capitalizing off of her audience that she already had but she's not selling them like eBooks. She's selling them lipstick, you know, and that's, that's the power of it. We're in a, in a consumer driven economy and world right now and selling them what they want first is a great way. You might end up selling them things that have better margins as you develop as an entrepreneur, but I think there's always a place for physical products. I think that is, if I could make people start with one thing in this thing, I would say physical products would be the thing because you're going to, you're going to make sales and you're going to deal with customers. And there's, there's like getting that, that, that first 
alchemy is the hardest one. Finding the first gold nugget or, or, or getting the first drip of oil, right? That's the, yep. that's the hardest one. And then once you get that, then you get addicted to it. And that's part of what you want is that being addicted, right? Because yeah. then you're always looking and seeing and thinking and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's pretty powerful. Synthesizing new ideas and thinking about, well, if I took that and I, I branded this different and I did that and I sold it over here. And so there are countless people who are buying something over here and selling it over here. They're buying something at Goodwill and they're selling it on eBay. They're buying something on Etsy and they're selling it at the farmer's market. And so this, it's, it's mildly an arbitrage thing, but they're, they're repurposing, they're transforming, they're rebranding. Hell, they're just listing things straight away. I've got one friend who literally lists products from uh, Home Depot onto eBay. And when they sell on eBay, he logs into Home Depot and he drop ships them. Why would anybody be interested in that? Because eBay will sell it internationally and people in Australia can't buy a Ryobi impact gun unless they buy it on eBay and eBay pays the shipping to go international. Just literally middlemanning things because there is a gap in the marketplace that he found from being yeah. observant, from being aware of what's going on in his world. Um, any cool. last comments before I, I wrap up and, and tell people what their what their homework is? Yeah, I was just going to say the, 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 the last thing that's powerful about this is once you go from um, once you go from consumer to creator or merchant, then what you one of the big shifts that happens is you become a better noticer is what I call it. Like you start to see opportunity everywhere. And you start to realize like how amazing that this world is that we're in, right? And that there's a there's this ability to um, be walking down the street and get an idea that could mean millions of dollars for you and your family. I mean, that's yep. pretty powerful. And you see it in a Facebook ad that pops up randomly. You see it on a billboard. And then you have, I call it idea sex, right? And you've been seeing all this different stuff. And those ideas are mating in your brain and something new pops out. And you're like, what if I took that from there and that? And I wrapped it and I branded it like that. Bingo. Now today we have the ability to take these ideas, get prototypes together and test through ads lickety split that's and that's that's the game 